I'm on my way back, at last. For a long time, I've been collecting up the courage to make this journey. My goal is clear. I want to sneak into the Nuba Mountains in the Sudanese province of Kordofan. I'd like to visit my friends of the African Nuba Mesakin tribe. Nineteen years ago, they welcomed me into their midst and treated me as one of their own. I've never again met such healthy, contented, happy people, although I look for them among the Australian Aborigines, the American Indians, the Tibetans, the Polynesians, Africa is a synonym for extreme poverty, disease, and primitivism. But none of it is true. On the contrary, Africa is rich. Africa is rich with strategic raw materials. Africa is the richest continent for natural resources. And of all African states, Sudan is the richest, and at the same time the poorest, and in appearance, the most isolated. How is this possible? Why? What's going on? Not many tourists make it to Sudan. 
In Sudan, hidden from the world, the longest African civil war has been raging. A war between the Arab Muslim North and the African animist Christian South, as the Western media say, or the holy war between God and Satan, as is reported by the Arab media. The Nuba Mountains are caught in the middle, sealed shut and cut off from the world. The Nuba are surrounded and besieged. No reporter, no observer, no humanitarian organization is allowed to enter the area. And this is why I didn't get any news from the mountains for more than 15 years. Some idea of what was happening to my people I learned from the book Facing Genocide, published by the British agency African Rights in 1995. So to get inside the Nuba Mountains will be for sure illegal. I'm traveling by bike. It's the best way to sneak past the government army and the various militias to the other side, beyond the boundaries of the known and controlled world. The few Western reports that exist imply that the people living in the oases along the Nile in northern Sudan are terrorists, Islamic fundamentalists or extreme nationalists. But as I cycled through Nubia in northern Sudan, locals kept inviting me to their homes. Fatal, fatal, they shouted. Fatal means sit down, rest, spend the night under our roof, have tea with us, share our food. In the Nubia oasis, there are no hotels. Instead of hotels, they have a much older tradition, hospitality. Ask me for breakfast. Thank you very much. You Nubian people are very, very kind. Shokran. Salam alaikum. The Nubians of northern Sudan are descendants of an ancient African kingdom and heirs to one of the oldest cultures on the planet. Their ancient capital, Kush, is mentioned in the Bible. A thousand years before Christ, the Nubians conquered Egypt and reigned in the entire Nile Valley from the Great Lakes to the Mediterranean Sea. In the same period, black kings ruled in Thebes. The pyramids, temples and other monuments bear witness to a culture related to the ancient Egyptian, but nevertheless specifically African. The latest research shows that Africa contributed much more to the treasure chest of European civilization than some of our racially biased historians are willing to admit. Cleopatra was in fact black. The white Cleopatra was created by Hollywood. <laughs> Nubians, once animist and later converted to Christianity, are nowadays Muslim. You are a divine messenger, Nubians often said to me, and asked me to tell them about life elsewhere in the world. I told them about Europe, about living in the fast lane, about our fears. And they told me how their government exploits them, how they cannot identify themselves with the regime because they're more interested to lead a modest, honest, pious life than to export the Islamic revolution. Tell your people back home that this is not our government, they begged me. It's the Mafia, Arab conquistadors, who after they had exploited our hospitality for centuries, finally won 
They forced themselves on us, and there's nothing we can do. However, Nubians did not hold a very high opinion of the Nuba. Nubians believe that the Nuba are descendants of those Nubians who, after the fall of the famous Nubian empires, fled from the Arab slave hunters to the mountains in the south, abandoned civilization and ran completely wild. I kept hearing them say, a Nuba drinks alcohol, he eats pork, he has sex all the time. The Nuba attack from their mountains. See, that's why there's no roads in Sudan, no factories, no industry. The Nuba must become Muslim. The Nuba must be assimilated or exterminated. In the ancient Egyptian language, Nuba means slave. Through the last stretch of the desert en route to Khartoum, I hitched a ride on a lorry. It was a long and dusty trip. Khartoum looked like a ghost town. Nineteen years ago, it was a pleasant, anglified town. But now it was derelict, packed with refugees from all over Sudan. A curfew was imposed after ten in the evening. Ever since the Declaration of Independence in 1956, they wouldn't leave us alone, I heard people say in this tea house. Who wouldn't leave you alone? Why? I asked. But the men dressed in white would only smile mysteriously. The British first started interfering in Sudanese affairs at the end of the 19th century. Convinced of their mission to civilize, they sent in their most powerful colonial leader, Charles Gordon, to abolish the shameful Arab slave trade and introduce a modern variant, colonial trade. Gordon never managed to eradicate the slave trade, but by spreading Christianity, he provoked a strong Islamic fundamentalist reaction. And revolutionaries led by Mahdi, the long-awaited prophet, promptly decapitated Gordon. England rose against the new religious fervor with modern military technology. In the Great Battle of Khartoum in 1898, the United British Egyptian Army massacred 12,000 of Mahdi's followers who were armed with nothing but swords and the belief that they were immune to infidel bullets. The victorious British then drew the same borders of Sudan that we find today. After the British departure in the mid-50s, what remained enclosed within those borders was a multitude of different peoples and cultures unable to find a common language. The descendants of black slaves in the south never trusted the descendants of the slave hunters in the north, and vice versa. In 1983, soon after the Americans discovered abundant quantities of crude oil on the border between the Arab north and the African south, war broke out. Some observers believe it was the CIA who incited the Southerners to fight for oil. Others claim that they rose up simply in protest against Islamic laws, which all of a sudden forbade the consumption of alcohol and demanded that adulterers be stoned. Whichever the case, there seems to be no end to the war. The conflict between the Sudanese and global vested interests has so far claimed at least two million victims and the Nuba have suffered most in the fight to control Sudanese natural resources. The Nuba mountains lie in the north, on the Arab side, just above the line between the two Sudans as drawn by the British. Just like the oil in the swamps and the uranium in the Nuba mountains, the Nuba people themselves were caught between two fires. However, Mahdi's dervishes, mystics of the Islamic sect of Sufis, survived everything. In Khartoum, they gather every Friday at the cemetery Al-Sheikh Hamad El-Nil 
and spin around until they fall into a trance. Then they hug each other and celebrate. I also found myself caught up in the euphoric state. I felt the ecstatic trance, able to exercise my fears and to move my deepest being from my brain into my heart. I was quite overwhelmed by the spiritual power which the Northern Sudanese use to control their everyday problems, and scared too, because I suspected that the same power was being abused by the pragmatists in the Arab government for quite non-religious purposes. The fanatical fundamentalists try to scare the foreigners who want to possess their natural riches with an ideology akin to ein Volk, ein Land, ein Führer. Extreme nationalism, fascism and communism strengthen the unity and power of a nation. All who are marginal, all who are different, like the Nuba, they need to be incorporated into a single people who believe in the same God in order to be strong and able to resist the superior Westerners, as happened once before in the time of the great Mahdi. And that is really what uh, uh, people look after reality and uh, happiness. Happiness is unity, you see. It's not to be so many things. And to, it's, it's said, it is said to be so many things, you see. Lying and hoping for things that are real things, like money. Because if you have money, you are strong. If you are strong, you are going to dominate other people's life. These are just the false things, you see. They are not true things. You see. When you are going, life is, is not like that. When you go to the Nuba mountains, as you say, people live with nature, in harmony with nature. Even if they, they are pagans, if they believe in trees, this is more natural than what, than what we have here, because they uh, live in nature. I had no idea what was in store for me. In order to look like the local people, I had a white Arab jalaba made. I got my bike ready, loaded it up with water containers. A week later, and a thousand kilometers further south, the Arab world transforms rapidly into the African. With a great deal of luck, and without major problems, and with my trusty bike, I managed to sneak behind the war zone, where no foreigner has penetrated for 17 years. I was first arrested in the village of Abbasia. And I was only rescued thanks to an interview published in the Islamic National Party Gazette in which I was presented as the friend of the revolution. For a few days, I was all alone. I enjoyed peace and solitude and almost forgot about the war. I felt at home as I hadn't felt for a long time. Perhaps Africa really is the original home of all people. Perhaps I was really traveling toward my roots. Home. Home. I'm going home. Hello! A long time ago, all this was the land of the Nuba. However, the first Nuba I came across had already been converted to Islam. They were Arabs. They offered me food and water. They imbued me with willpower and courage, and they gave me directions to Kauniaro. It was more than 50 degrees Celsius, absolutely dry and very, very thorny. On the fourth day, I ran out of water. In that heat, you can die in a day without water. I was going crazy. My tires were flat. And then suddenly, they rode towards me from the bush and offered me a bowl of milk, camel milk. What an incredible animal, the camel. It walks through a furnace weighed down with burdens and transforms my enemy, the thorn, into a life-saving elixir. 
Ma ne boš nekaj smegdaj pil. After seven days of cycling, I finally found Niaro. In this Nuba village in 1949, the British photographer and filmmaker George Roger shot the scenes which made the Nuba famous all over the world. The pictures attracted the attention of the German artist Leni Riefenstahl, who, charmed by the beauty and power of the Nuba, published her book, The People of Kao, in 1976, which made the Nuba even more famous. This is what it was like a long time ago. But in Kauniaro, you don't find any naked, decorated, scarred people anymore. The locals who welcome me were dressed, some like Arabs, others like Europeans, but they all claimed to be Arabs. All boys and men were without exception members of the militia of the Islamic National Party, which rules the country. But I never saw them pray as people do elsewhere in Sudan, and in the night I often heard African drums. What happened? I was asking myself. The huts are still the same as in Lenny's book, and so are the trees and the rocks, but the people are different. El Kitab, an old man told me. The book. The book killed them. Which book? Lenny's book. The agony in this village, and the agony of the entire country, started soon after Lenny Riefenstahl's book reached Khartoum. Puritanical Islamic Sudan was deeply ashamed of these photographs of naked Nuba, and fundamentalists soon forced them to wear clothes and to adopt the Arab identity. Whoever resisted disappeared. But some of the old classic beauty has remained. The relaxed postures of the children, here I find it. The way the parents take care of them. The way they hug the trees, here I find it. The way they watch the stars and dream. The village of Kao was not conquered by the government army, but by the Sufis from the north. With drumming and jingling of bells, these ascetic nomads found it easy to touch Nuba hearts and to convert the surviving Nuba to Islam. After the Sufis came the Arab politicians. And in their eyes, I can feel the slave hunters. Further south, the endless savannas and swamps of the Nile spread out. The biggest swamps in the world. This is the land of the rebellious Dinkas, the Nuas, and the Shiluks. <laughs> In the villages scattered around the southernmost Nuba mountain, Liri, there were also dances when the moon was full. But those Nuba who remain in Liri, they also dance as dictated by the victorious Bagara Arab nomads.
And so I met Hamid, a nomad belonging to the Bagara tribe. He's getting married this year. He's happy to have found a pretty wife, and in a little while... The Bagara are Arab nomads who have herded cattle in the savannas of the Nuba Mountains for centuries. In Arabic, Bagara means cow. They are traditional neighbors of the Nuba, and the two peoples used to live in harmony, insofar as harmony is possible between nomads and farmers. The Arab nomads would always trample down the Nuba fields until finally the Nuba had had enough. Although third-class citizens themselves, the Bagara received arms from the government in the late 80s. They allowed themselves to be sent in to fight against the now rebellious Nuba. So Lavinia, Europa. Europa. It's a big uh, village. As soon as I reached Talodi, I was arrested for the third time since I left Khartoum. And it was from Anuba, in prison with me, that I first heard stories about the concentration camps. After three days of brutal interrogation, I managed to trick them and to escape over the front line. I was afraid that the Nuba rebels might take me for an Arab and shoot me from afar. So in order to show my true color, I stripped to the skin. And we met. Twice. But when I wanted to follow them to the mountains, they rejected me, saying that if they took me, they risked new attacks from the government army. So I had no other choice but to go back to the government side. Turoji. So these are the culprits. These are the men who are burning Nuba homes, raping Nuba women, and locking Nuba children away from their families in camps specially set up for the purpose. These are the slaves who are killing the slaves. This is the Arab strategy to indoctrinate the captured Nuba boys and turn them against their own people. The Nuba are primitive. They must all die. Only then will Sudan be as rich as Saudi Arabia. Do you know how much oil we have here, boasted a Sudanese officer who'd been trained at the military academy in Sarajevo. Sarajevo, in the Nuba Mountains. That's too much irony. Turoji, Angolo, Buram, Reka, these are the names of government strongholds on the southern side of the mountains. Altogether, there are more than 30. The Arabs call them Dar el Salam, peace camps. But in fact, they are well-guarded barracks erected on the ruins of the conquered Nuba villages. They are the bases for the offensive. The concentration camps aimed at converting the Nuba into Arabs, as well as the training grounds for the Janissaries. They told me that the school and the new mosque were erected by UNICEF. What's UNICEF doing here on the government side, I asked myself. And I felt sick. So what's awaiting me in my village, Rekha? Twenty years ago, Rekha was my home. I was happy here. I found the millet threshers in my village in a trance similar to that of 20 years ago. But the threshers themselves were no longer the same Nuba Mesakin. The people in the Rekha concentration camp are new people, forcibly brought here from far away mountains. Hi. 
I found my old house burnt down and destroyed. As far as I could see, there were only ruins and mines, but nobody knew exactly where they were. Neither the Arab Nuba nor the Mesakin Nuba rebels dare return to their homes. This country has died. Once a green and neat administrative center of the Nuba Mountains has turned into a dump yard during the 17 years of the war. The Nuba tribe of Kadugli had been replaced by crossbreeds from all over Sudan who didn't look at all friendly. Men and women, members of the Islamic National Front, kept marching up and down the main street. Nowhere else did I see so many soldiers. During the night, in the only modest hotel, I was once more surprised by the armed men of the security service. They tried hard to terrify me before letting me go on toward the north. Disappointed at what I had found, and desperate because I couldn't find a way to get to the rebels, I returned to Khartoum. I circled the entire Nuba mountain range. I tried everything to no avail, on foot, by bike. It was impossible. And then Barbara came to my rescue, my own Barbara. In Kadugli, Barbara managed to get a permit for us to travel to the government peace camps of Um Sadiba and Um Dorain, which I couldn't reach on my own. They kept telling us, a woman in Sudan has no enemy. And it was true, they helped Barbara much more than they'd helped me. Barbara wanted to go straight to the rebels, and so we tried again together. We traveled in comfort, like kings. We invented a whole new kind of tourism. We traveled by lorry, all the time under the supervision of government soldiers, who once had been the Moro Nuba, but who had become Arabs and seemed to be proud of it. Finally, the rainy season, which was a couple of months late, caught up with us. The desert turned into a green and luxuriant country. In the Um Sadiba camp, the officers offered us their beds and organized a majestic dance. Here too, the Nuba no longer dance their traditional dances. Barbara and I noticed that almost all the women were pregnant. We were amazed by this unusually high fertility rate, but when we wanted to talk to the women in private, the soldiers would brutally chase them away. Later we heard that the women were being kept there as concubines for the fair-skinned soldiers. Ethnic cleansing was being carried out through the cleansing of blood. We felt that the officers were letting us see only what they had prepared for us, and that our visit was being directed so as to convince us that everything was all right in the camp. Barbara was cleaning and dressing the wounds, giving massages, teaching yoga exercises. And in return, the women plaited her hair using mud instead of gel. In no time at all, the shade of a tree had become a beauty parlor. 
The children taught us a game that we used to know. Twenty of our people were burnt alive, an old Nuba told us in broken English, in 1993. Near here, in the village of Alatmur, they locked them in the church and burnt them all. What does Islam mean to you? We asked an officer. Islam, it means to do everything right, he replied, after a long pause. The bandits are all around. It's too dangerous, said the commandant, in order to explain why they would never let us walk anywhere alone. Only then did we realize that we were in fact captives ourselves. En route to the Umdorain camp, we tried to escape to the rebel side, but we failed. They didn't punish us. Instead, they took us places, showed us things, trying to prove what an important role the Sudanese army is playing in bringing civilization to the mountain savages. It was clear that they wanted to use us to broadcast government propaganda. And so, in the end, we just took full advantage of traditional Sudanese hospitality and also their respect for former Yugoslavia. Had we been English or American, the whole story might have been different. Um Dorein once home to several thousand Nuba of the Moro tribe, was in ruins. The remaining Moro were being kept in the camp under the vigilant surveillance of guards with machine guns. We learned that humanitarian aid had never reached them because the soldiers had stolen everything. They also told us that the entire area was mined. To attempt illegally to go to the rebel side would be nothing more than to attempt suicide. All the way home to Europe, I kept thinking, no peace, no oil. No oil, no peace. How could they possibly exploit their natural resources if the whole area is mined? What I had failed to achieve by bike, I might, so it seemed, achieve by plane. So I'm flying. I'm flying to the rebels in the Nuba Mountains. Suddenly everything seems so simple, except that it isn't. So far, the government troops have destroyed three foreign planes, claiming that they were only protecting the sovereignty of their territory. It's difficult to find a brave enough pilot. But after two weeks of waiting, I found myself on board a rented aircraft, together with a hundred kilos of medicine gathered in Slovenia. It was being paid for by the German humanitarian organization, German Emergency Doctors, the only organization providing direct aid to the rebels. We took off on the Kenyan border, from the same airport as a hundred other planes a day, which, in the largest humanitarian drive in the history of mankind, was carrying aid to all those dying in southern Sudan, to all but not the Nuba. Why are the German emergency doctors the only people helping the Nuba? Where are all the others? Where are the UN and UNICEF? Ah, so these are the dangerous savages, as their propaganda would have us believe. 
Three tons of millet disappeared like a pinch of sugar thrown to starving ants. The last grains were scratched from the ground by children. The women put the bundles containing medicine on their heads and we set off uphill. The Nuba Mountains, because of their historical isolation, have preserved primordial human sensitivity, adaptability, a primal respect for everything, and above all, an ancient people's democracy. Trees, plants, rocks, animals and people have all learned to live in harmony and symbiosis with everything that surrounds them. The black soil is extremely fertile and enables sorghum to be cultivated, the essential food in the Nuba diet. These granite islands in the sea of the South Kordofan savannas retain water even during the most severe droughts. The Nuba civilization is one of the oldest in Africa and in the world. The Nuba mountains are a kind of natural fortress which have since ancient times provided shelter for various African peoples. The Nuba, more than 50 different tribes, have more or less all congregated here in their flight from the slave hunters. Perhaps this is why they understand and tolerate each other so well and why they are so tolerant of foreigners. The rebellious Nuba are master keepers of their natural environment. They have invented no machines, built no skyscrapers, erected no monuments, never flown to the moon, and neither have they in any way harmed their environment. The waters are clear, the soil and air is pure. The Nuba are true ecologists. The Nuba are just pure people. The majority of the Nuba don't care for the uranium or the gold discovered in their mountains by foreigners. The Nuba, despite the war, devote most of their time to family, friends, socializing, and numerous rituals in which they keep giving thanks for every drop of rain, every growing seed, and in all humility, they ask for the same again. The Nuba, as I've noticed, have what we Westerners lack the most. In my opinion, we need them more than they need us. Perhaps someday the Nuba Mountains will be a kind of sanatorium for healing those of us who have lost faith in humanity, given, of course, that the Nuba survive. Nevertheless, my bliss soon came to an end. At noon, the day after our arrival, we got news that the neighboring mountain was being bombarded. Four people are injured. Two men, two women, and two men. The four who are injured, they are the civilians. They are not the soldiers. They are not the SPLA forces. They are the civilians. You know, this is a cold deal. Then it was our turn. In the village, dogs howled, children cried, and then. Two women and four children. Why do you foreigners make planes and fly them in the air and drop bombs, they ask us. Why do you foreigners like death? We, the Nuba, we like dancing and singing and life. And at that moment, 
I realized I was standing on the altar the modern world has chosen to make a human sacrifice. And I felt shame. Shame for the color of my skin and shame for the culture that made me. No, I have nothing in common with those businessmen, politicians, preachers, and even those charities that support those who drop bombs on innocent children, women, and old men. I'm on the other side. I'm across the border. I defected. The Nuba don't wait. The Nuba bury their dead straight away. Yusuf Kua Maki. Maki is an Arabic name. It's not a Nuba name. Kua is a Nuba name. Yes, we are rebels, yes. We are rebelling against the old Sudan. We want to destroy the monopoly of power into these minorities. So we would like to see this power is shared by all the Sudanese nationalities. It's really a pity. Uh, nobody would like to die, and nobody would like to kill, actually. But as somebody who has an objective, and uh, we think we are right in our course, of course, this is, this is war, and war of freedom. So, although one is not happy, but of course, we have to pay that. This is the price of freedom. The rebellion of Africans in southern Sudan against the supremacy of the Arab North spread to the Nuba Mountains in June 1985. The legendary Yusuf Kua Maki rose against the forced Arabization and the government reacted with a plan for the systematic displacement of the mountain dwellers to camps in the north. The genocidal policy culminated in 1993 when the Nuas in the south, hitherto rebels, surrendered to the government and thus cut off the Nuba from the help of other rebels in the south of Sudan and consequently from the whole world. The rebel army is a voluntary one. Every soldier has to provide a weapon for himself, to grow food and to take care of his family. With the weapons confiscated from the government army, the Nuba partisans have survived every offensive. Nobody has managed to drag them out of their caves in the mountains, neither Iraqi military consultants nor Iranians with chemical weapons. However, 20 years ago, they were 2 million strong, and today only 250,000 remain who are still fighting for the right to be Nuba. In October every year, they come together and debate whether to continue the fight or surrender, so far, they have always persuaded one another to keep fighting. Everywhere in the country, I saw the traces of war. Abandoned fields, burnt down houses, demolished schools, churches and mosques. <laughs> We believe all religions are the same, even what they call it pagan. I don't believe they are pagans. This is a word given by Muslims or Christians. But uh, if you go to the village and you ask this man who is not a Muslim, who is not a Christian, and he will tell you, well, what I am doing, there is God. Whatever I do, I ask him and he answers me. So he is a God believer. Let him choose the way he wants to choose. And this is show how democratic our society is, even in terms of uh, religion. That is 
I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think there's actually what make us to look wrongly to this to our own beautiful bodies is a religious concept. But uh, the way our people who used to go naked, they don't they don't see why people are, are really uh, ashamed of being naked. It is just like a hand. It has a, a special function. Or a nose, which has a special function. They don't look at it the way other people look at it. That is why they don't feel it is a shame. I think the will of God creates us differently. Uh, we have a different colors, different shape, different leaves, different environment. So this is the world. This is the way I would like the whole world to live. I too would like to live in a world like this. That's why I came here. For six weeks, I walked the majority of the mountains with the rebels and saw again with my own eyes that the Nuba Mountains are the least consumer-oriented place on earth. On the other side of the world, there is not one single shop, not one single road, not one single car. The only trade takes place in a few markets separated one from the other by a day's walk or more. You can buy salt, a few lemons, a pouch of marijuana, a fistful of peanuts, but millet is not for sale. Millet is strategic food and can only be given away for free. Giving millet as a gift means giving life. In the valley of the Tacho tribe, they told us they'd never been visited by white foreigners. Even the other Nuba hardly ever go there. Why do you bring us clothes, they asked. We can't eat clothes. Before the first harvest, at least 200 people died of starvation. The whole country was hungry. So hungry. People are here suffering a lot. People are strong, but some people, especially in other countries, people like European people, they don't know how to move a mountain. But if they, they come here, they can see what move a mountain people are. They can imagine, they can prove. But they can know exactly the mountain are isolated from Sudan, but it, it is inside Sudan country, but it's forgotten. It's forgotten. People are forgotten. They are primitive people. They are not educated people. Some people are just, they don't know what they are, but they are forgotten. Of the 250,000 that have survived, one-fifth surrendered in that year alone to the government army, even though they knew what was in store for them. They were tempted by the bait, the food in the peace camps, and by that other more treacherous bait, education, that would turn Nuba children into Arabs, but that would ensure their survival. The schools are being set up in the very camps themselves and set up by Western humanitarian organizations headed by UNICEF, supported by the sensitive heart of the rich world. And in fact, they are accusing the United Nations of helping the Sudan government because they are bringing relief on the other side to the help, Sudan health towns and refusing to bring it here. And this is how, uh, this is, uh, and this is part of the genocide through food. Once, I used to lie to myself that I wanted to stay neutral. But now I find myself here among the rebels against the ominous New World Order that everywhere tries to dominate. On the other side, I'm here, now, without UNICEF, Rockefeller, Coca-Cola, Marlboro, McDonald's. No, yeah. Small, small. Just as elsewhere in the Third World, the civil war in Sudan is in the interest of the wider Western, the American and European, and the wider Eastern, the Arab and Asian powers. And these two are struggling to control strategic resources. The Nuba are just the saddest victims of these infinitely greedy appetites. And where are we? 
in all this? We are quite humble people, no? uh, one of that big nations who've been colonizing the world. Um, so maybe that's why we, we can understand you better. <laughs> We're struggling for survival. Oh, the centuries. And before the Austrian and